Okay, shall we start? Thank you very much for coming to today's EES UBLJ seminar in the Slavic Research and Research Center, Hokkaido University. Sorry, the sound is a little bit confused. Okay, probably this is okay. Today, we invite a prominent scholar from Poland as a speaker. Her name is Magdalena Grabowska from Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences. She is a specialist on gender issues in Poland, uh, and she is the author, the author of the book, Broken Genealogy, Women's Social and Political Activism Post-1945 and a, a Contemporary Women's Movement in Poland, which was published in 2018. And uh, 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 also of numerous papers. She worked on uh, research projects with international institutions, including European Commission, uh, European Institute for Gender Equality, and so on. INGOs, including Ball Foundation and the Open Society Institute. Multiple academic institutions, as well as local governmental and non-governmental organizations, and she participated uh, participates in various research projects. For example, the design and uh, implement implementation of a nationwide quantitative and qualitative study on the scale of sexual violence against women. So, Dr. Grabowska has not only uh, performed profound academic knowledge, but also wide vision of the contemporary women's movement based on her experiences. Therefore, uh, we decided to hold a two-part seminar today. In the first part of the seminar, she will talk about, the, uh, talk about how women's organization, rather than the Polish government, have been taking care of the uh, reception of, of Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Uh, for this topic, we invite another special guest, Dr. Naomi Chi of Graduate School of Public Policy, uh, public, sorry, public, Hokkaido University, who specializes in gender issues and in, in immigrant issues in Eastern Asia. In the second part, uh, Dr. Grabowska will talk about gender-related issues in Poland from a larger historical perspective. And after the talk, we will also invite a great specialist, Mie Nakachi from Hokusei Gakuen University, who specializes in gender issues during the uh, Soviet era. So today's seminar will be uh, quite intensive. So uh, uh, please enjoy the talk talks. So let's start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take my glasses. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you everyone for uh, coming either in person or uh, online. And uh, I would like to share my presentation. I don't know how. All right. Uh, I hope you you can see it. Uh, my presentation is called Ukrainian Women Refugees and Women's Organizations in Poland. And I would like to uh, divide this presentation into four parts. First, I would like to talk briefly about the gendered spaces of war. And I would like to talk about the masculinity, women at war and gender equality during war. Second, I would like to talk about women refugees in Poland and uh, give you a brief characteristic of the group uh, of refugees that came to Poland after the beginning of the war. Um, then uh, I would move on to uh, overview the help that the, those women receive, uh, mostly from women. And here I want to emphasize this gender aspect of that help. So on one hand, we have women who are fleeing the war. On the other hand, we have women who are helping those uh, women. And finally, I would like to con conclude with the broader 
some conclusions uh, um, regarding the broader context of this help, and in particular, the gender and the crisis of social reproduction in the face of the recurring crisis, and I mean the COVID crisis, uh, crisis at the Belarusian border, reproductive rights crisis, and the war in, in Ukraine. So these are the four crises that we are experiencing right now in Poland. And let me start from uh, the question of the gender phases of the war. And uh, I would like to start from the question of masculinity. And uh, some of you may have seen uh, this video that surfaced right after the war started. It was the video of the uh, President Zelensky dancing into the Beyonce music back when he was um, he had a career as a comedian and entertainment and entertain entertainer, and the video that was uh, directed to um, dis disgrace him uh, politically uh, turned public's attention into the two masculinities, two types of masculinities that are in competition during the uh, war in Ukraine. And on one hand, we have the traditional hegemonic masculinity represented by uh, President Vladimir Putin. Uh, one can argue that this is uh, what uh, scholars talk the toxic, co call the toxic masculinity, socially destructive, which uh, exhibits the socially destructive aspects of hegemonic masculinity, such as misogyny, hem homophobia, and violent domination. And this characteristic can be seen in a Cold War start leadership, treating war as a homosocial enactment, meaning that only men participate in the war. So this is the war between men and women are only passive victims of the war. And one person decision-making process that are characteristic, characteristic, characteristic to the Russian leader. And on the other hand, this type of masculinity is, uh, and style of governing or style of political leadership is tied into what we uh, know, know from around the world as an anti-gender ideology and anti-LGBT ideology, uh, the discourses, narratives, and policies. Uh, which are based in the so-called protection of family values um, and are uh, exemplified in Russia by the homosexual propaganda law that was uh, um, implemented in 2013 and the removal of st uh, statue of battery that was from the Russian criminal code in 2017. On the other hand, we have this alternative masculinity that one can argue is represented by, by President Zelensky, uh, the masculinity that is... Um, being performed as closer to people set in collaboration and able to show emotions. Here we have the photo of uh, President Zelensky visiting Bucha after the uh, it was uh, uh, freed from Russian troops uh, and uh, he uh, was visibly touched and cried there. Uh, this is also the, uh, the, the type of mas mascul masculinity that potentially can be favorable for non-traditional gender roles. Uh, one can ask if this is the um, strategic projection to use used to represent the uh, Ukrainian president as more modern and more, more European, but uh, uh, I will uh, briefly talk about what this can mean to the gender equality later on. Uh, another gender phase of war is uh, the participation of women in war. Uh, and uh, in uh, in Ukraine, about 50,000 women are serving in Ukrainian armed forces in combat and non-combat roles, in which about 10,000 are either in the front lines uh, of the war or in jobs that could send them to the front lines. And the um, question of the participation of women in the Ukrainian military um, um, forces is the question that we know that is happening. That, that, that debate uh, brings us back to 2014 when during the Maidan protest, uh, women established the so-called women battalion to participate in the, uh, in the military protest. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, women are predominantly uh, seen as the um, victims of the attacks on the civilians and recently recently published United Nations reports uh, um, prepared by the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine documented patterns of executions, unlawful confinement, torture, ill treatment, rape and other sexual violence committed in areas occupied by Russian forces. Uh, the UN um, report talks about more than 100 cases to which victims are from four to eight years old. And this is a known strategy of using rape and sexual assault as a military strategy and deliberate ta tactic to de dehumanize victims. Uh, and uh, it was uh, studied by scholars, particularly uh, in the context of Balkan wars, in a way in which traditional gender roles and patriarchal culture play a part in the violent ma map making and ethno nationalism. 
Uh, but there are also positive sides into uh, gender uh, aspects of the war. Um, and in particular, the progress that it can be made during the war proceedings. And there are two examples of that in case of Ukraine. Uh, first of all, first, first of all, uh, the, in the area of violence, fighting violence against women, in June 2022, Ver Verkhovna Rada ratified the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, better known as the Istanbul Convention. Convention will enter into force uh, in Ukraine on 1st of November 2020, and this is the infamous Istanbul Convention that often sparkled uh, the anti-gender backlash in many European states, including Bulgaria, Poland, and Hungary. Uh, on the other hand, on August 2020, President Zelensky promised that the government will work out options for a solution regarding the legalization in Ukraine of registered civil partnership under the uh, auspices uh, of work on the confirmation and protection of human rights and freedoms. And this is the very vague promise that the question of same-sex partnership or marriage will be uh, considered by uh, Ukraine uh, post-war. Um, in the, and, um, and then there is this biggest part of the consequences, gender consequences of uh, war in Ukraine, which is the uh, uh, big, amount, big wave of women refugees that are leaving Ukraine, seeking refuge in uh, mostly in European countries and uh, mostly in Poland. Since February 24, 2020, over uh, 1.8 million of Ukrainians have arrived to Poland. Overwhelming majority of those who are fleeing the war, almost 90% are women between 30 and 44 years old, accompanied by children and elderly family members, and the 10% of men that are entering Poland uh, are mostly it's, are either boys, so men uh, under 18 years old, or older men. What is interesting is that these women are well educated. 50% uh, hold a higher degree education, uh, higher degree education, and are eager to work. 30% of Ukrainian women have stable job, and 50% is looking for a job. Almost half of women migrants have never been to Poland and did not have any ties to Poland before the war. Despite that, in May 2020, so which is roughly three months after they arrived, 50% of them already spoke some Polish at the basic level, so they are pretty determined. Two thirds uh, of the refugees do not plan to stay in Poland, however, permanently. They want to go back to Ukraine, and this is actually really already happening. Uh, according to the um, border control, there's over 7 million Ukrainians who uh, entered Poland uh, after the war be began, and a 5 million who came back already. So th that leads to roughly 2 million who is somewhere in Europe. Uh, women are more eager to eager to come back to Ukraine uh, for obvious reasons. Many of them have uh, husbands or sons there. Um, better educated people are also eager to go back to Ukra Ukraine whether, uh, whenever it's possible. Uh, most of the respondents are saying that they want to go back to Ukraine in less than a year. So they are not planning to stay in Poland. This changes the, uh, the demographic of the um, Ukrainian migrants in Poland. Before February 22, uh, Poland was the main destination for a Ukraini Ukrainian economic seasonal migration. And 38% of all Ukrainian migrants, so people who migrated from Ukraine uh, to different countries, chose Poland. Uh, 1.5 million Ukrainian workers and 50,000 students uh, constituted 57% of all migrants in Poland. So Ukrainians are the biggest migrant, have been traditionally the biggest migrant group, mig migrant group in Poland. Uh, interestingly, 54% of the of this, these migrants before February 2020 were, were men and between 18 and 44 years old, so younger men, one could say. Uh, seasonal migrant workers work predominantly in the following sectors of economy, production, construction, transport and logistic, various seasonal work, farming, cleaning and childcare. And importantly, uh, there was the trend since uh, 2016 to 2022 of uh, Ukrainian starting up Ukrainian businesses in Poland. Uh, in June 2021, 60,000 Ukrainian businesses were um, set in, uh, in Poland. But the, uh, the, the, this group who arrived to Poland uh, after the war in Ukraine started has specific needs. And you can see it, it is very different from the 
uh, previous group of migrants that were uh, present that, 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 that were present in Poland. And there are several areas in which the, the, these needs can be um, examined. First of all, this is childcare and education, a need to combine wage, wage work and childcare while being a single parent, temporarily sim single parent. 30% of Ukrainian women are looking for a half-time positions, which are not popular form of positions in Poland because they are looking for uh, permanent positions, but half time. So th uh, they want to have all the social security benefits, but don't want to work full time to be able to manage the childcare, but also to keep those benefits that they already have. Uh, they, they are also seeking the economic state assistant, assistance and the Polish state has provided legal status, ID numbers and financial assistance to all of the families with children. And this is uh, in Poland, it's called 500 plus. This is the monthly uh, allowance that each family has for each child. Uh, this is roughly 5, 000, 15,000 yens. Um, and when they talk about their needs, they point to the fact that they would like to see uh, job search services and Polish language courses. Financial, financial support from Polish state is not a priority for those refugees. 48% uh, would rather have an opportunity to learn the language. And 44% uh, would want to receive assistance in finding a job. For example, job offers address, addressed to migrants. Uh, they are also uh, very interested in finding education for the children. It is estimated that seven, seven, uh, 700 to 800,000 Ukrainian children are in Poland as of September 2020, majority of these kids. Uh, 400,000 are elementary school children, so these are school children that cannot be left alone while the parent is at work uh, or at kindergarten or daycare. Minority is high, high, high school students, the ones who, who can manage their life uh, outside of the family life. Uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the next area is the reproductive health. Uh, women are seeking reproductive health assistance, abortions in case of war rape, abortion in case of fetus def defects are illegal in Poland, as we will find out in the second part of my talk, while they are legal in Ukraine. And there are already some cases of women who uh, decided not to come to Poland. Uh, there's, this was the case of 380 women from Bucha who, when they found out some of them uh, were raped uh, and they um, suspect that they might be pregnant. And when they found out that the Poland does not give them an opportunity to have an abortion, they decided not to come to Poland. Uh, and another problem is violence against women. Uh, women are seeking protection against the economic discrimination. Some This is the problem that uh, is uh, older than this uh, new wave of uh, migration, abuse and sexual abuse by hosts and employees. And there are there were several cases of uh, women refugees being abused by the private host, because as you may know, majority of those refugees, at least at, this, at, at some point of their um, being in, in Poland were hosted by the private host because of the, the state did not really have capacity to uh, to host this uh, this many people. So what was happening in the private homes, uh, it was kind of uh, not under the jurisdiction of the state and uh, some people reported uh, the cases of abuse and sexual abuse. And this is society, uh, civil society actors that um, in most cases respond to the needs that I just listed before. Uh, majority of those organizations are Ukrainian organizations uh, that are active in Poland. Again, this, uh, these are not organizations that are new uh, to, uh, in Poland. Uh, they are active for quite some time, uh, some of them uh, for more than 10 years. And uh, the example of the biggest, I think, organization, a Ukrainian house, and the foundation Our Choice. It's the organization that was founded in 2009. And this, and since the uh, February 2020, it offers free consultations for Ukrainian refugees. Uh, it has a women's club, which organizes workshop and support groups for Ukrainian refugees. It also has a Ukrainian school, uh, Polish language courses and research in Ukraine uh, on U in, and conducts research on Ukrainian migrants in Poland. So it, it actually uh, fits all those needs that, uh, that the, those uh, women have. Interestingly, this is an organization uh, uh, which consists of uh, mostly women. 
uh, out of 14 staff, 13 are women and only one, one man works there. And this is the founder of this organization, Miroslava Kerik, who is, uh, I think, uh, became, who has became, become the face of the um, assistance from the from Ukrainian women to the Ukrainian women after February uh, February 2020. But there are also society responses for women's groups in Poland, uh, and there are uh, they they try to assist Ukrainian refugees in uh, various areas. Organizations such as Women's Rights Cent Center assist uh, provide assistance for women who may experience violence and sexual violence. Federation on Women and Family Planning provides assistance for women in in the need for reproductive health services, prenatal care, contraception, or abortion. Abortion Dream Team, uh, which is the um, informal collective, provides instruction and assistance uh, of how to uh, perform abortion at home uh, using the so-called medical pill. Uh, there is also an intersectional help provided by those mm -hmm, uh, provided uh, for to those groups of uh, of women refugees and refugees in general who uh, who whose identities lie at the intersection of gender and other uh, identities. Uh, one example of that is ethnic minorities and especially uh, Romani uh, population. There are groups uh, in Poland, including Amnesty International and also Nanya Foundation, that. Uh, whose work is uh, aimed at counteracting a double standard in reception centers. Romani pe uh, people uh, are often refused uh, being hosted by, uh, by reception centers uh, and also by private houses and also experienced by acts of verbal and physical violence. There is a special uh, offer for LGBTQ community, especially in the area of seeking and sharing information about LGBTQ friendly accommodation in Poland and organizations such as Stonewall and Lambda are providing such uh, assistance. And this year, uh, Warsaw Pride was also combined with the Kiev Pride. Uh, there's, there's a lot of assistance being provided for persons with disability, especially in the area of uh, integration and support groups for uh, those uh, families that came with the family members that need, uh, who uh, have disabilities and need assistance. Uh, importantly, there is also a, a lot of local organizations that offer integration, safe accommodation, job search and education, and their activities focus a lot on integration and recreation. So providing this kind of friendly uh, new uh, life environment for uh, those who are, who, those refugees who came from Ukraine to those local activities. Uh, there are several cha challenges uh, that uh, both the population of Ukrainian refugees and Poland in general faces uh, in the in the face of uh, war and and um, the big wave of uh, women refugees. Uh, first of all, and this is the optimistic side, uh, Ukrainian Ukra Ukrainian workers may become a response for a democra democratic demo demographic crisis in Poland. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the economic crisis that is already experienced in Poland and is uh, expected to uh, become more and more uh, prominent uh, during winter may lead to the crisis of homelessness, uh, especially in the sense that these are private people who provide the accommodation and the revival of the stereotypes and prejudice against Ukrainian migrants. Uh, and the revival of historic, uh, historical political stereotypes. And uh, as some of you may know, uh, in Poland, some stereotypes uh, are that uh, parts of Ukrainian territories, particularly Western Ukraine, is a, a perceived as historically Polish. And there are also some resentments from the Second World War. And the biggest challenge, I think, is the lack of recognition of the social potential of the new type of migrant and active counteractions against the stereotypes of prejudice from the state. So on one hand, it is not recognized that these are mostly women who are the refugees. And on the other hand, there is no actions from the state to prevent the revival of the, uh, of the stereotypes and prejudice in the possible uh, case of the economic crisis. Uh, and in the broader context, uh, we have to see this uh, problem or the uh, issues, re those issues related to uh, women, Ukrainian women refugees in Poland and the assistance to them uh, in the context of lack of the institutional state responses to the systemic challenges. Uh, this is civil society and so social, mo social mobilization that replaces the state during the um, several crises that we experienced over the last two years. 
COVID-19, reproductive rights, refugee crisis at the Belarusian border and war in Ukraine, you can, the, uh, you can see the difference in, in which uh, the Ukrainian refugee crisis was handled uh, in comparison to a Belarusian refugee crisis in Polish-Belarusian border, there are still camps of people who are not uh, allowed to Poland, even though they should be legally uh, granted the refugee status. Uh, thirdly, there is appropriation of women's work by the state without recognizing it. So the state um, takes credit for being such a great and welcoming space for Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees without uh, recognizing the fact that these are mostly private people and mostly women who are providing this, uh, this help uh, instead of the state. Uh, and this is even strengthened by the fact that uh, there is still a very hostile, this is something that I will be talking about in the second part of my presentation, hostile environment to the feminist and LGBT activist work. State uh, is um, uh, ex uh, exhibiting uh, uh, state homophobia and tightening of women's rights, particularly in the case of abortion. And this is my last point. Uh, this uh, problem or this, these issues that I've talked about uh, probably have to be seen in a either broader global context of the capitalism and the reluctant dependence, uh, dependence on social reproduction. And this is not only a problem of Poland, but specifically during COVID, we saw how much capitalistic system profits from unpaid uh, work, reproductive work understood as life-making activities aiming at biological and social reproduction of the society and workforce, but rarely or never appreciates it. And COVID, uh, pandemic was one of the brief moments in which the states globe and this global po global state uh, had to recognize the fact that we are really all depending very much on this uh, often underpaid or unpaid work on uh, on social reproduction that is made uh, mostly by women. Thank you. Sorry for the okay, so uh, the second my second presentation uh, is called Gender Problems in Poland before and after nineteen eighty nine. And uh, I want to start by saying that October 22nd was the second anniversary of mass street demonstrations, the biggest in the post-1989 history of Poland against the further restrictions of the abortion law. Abortion was previously legal since 1956 and then restricted in 1993 to three cases. Crime, if the pregnancy, pregnancy was the result of crime, threat to woman, woman's life or health, or in case of fetus abnormalities, 1993 law was called an abortion compromise and was already one of the most restrictive in Europe. On October 22, 2020, Constitutional Tribunal of Poland judged the third premise, the fetus abnormalities, unconstitutional. And uh, it is important to note that until 2020, 97% of legal abortions in Poland uh, were done uh, due to that premise that was banned. So that made uh, abortion practically illegal in Poland. In reaction to that, uh, mass, uh, masses of people went out on the streets. And I'm just, I'm just going to show you some of the photos first before I will uh, start my presentation. I chose only the photos to, that, has, that have uh, English uh, language posters so you can see what was the tone and what was the message generally uh, of those protests. These were the mass decentralized mobilization around the feminist agenda, the biggest by far in Poland or in Eastern Europe since the 1989 or ever. For instance, on October 28, 2020, 410 protests were taking place, engaging 400,000 people, also people in small towns and cities. So not only this protest was mass and decentralized, but it was also, also an exhibition of politics of emotions. It was massive collective and overwhelming sense of fury, anger, but also solidarity, radical care and empathy that drove those protests to being. And you can see this 
especially on this photo, but also here. What was also characteristic to this uh, to these protests is what we can call radical rudeness, the tactical use of public insult. And I'm borrowing this uh, term from Stella Niazi, Ugandan activist. Slogans such as, and I'm going to curse now, "Get the fuck out" and "fuck peace" uh, are were the um, were the main slogans of this protest. Uh, importantly, these protests were uh, pro protests were also able to uh, generate social change. Uh, they did not reverse the verdict of the uh, constitutional tribunal, tribunal, but uh, all, but they made uh, the presence uh, of the radical language in the mainstream media. And the major opposition party changed its stand on the abortion, uh, promising that it will uh, liberalize abortion law after they win election. An election in Poland is next year. So in this uh, presentation, I want to see this protest in a longer perspective of gender equality and emancipation in Poland, particularly from the socialist state feminism to the European Union gender mainstreaming, but also in the shorter uh, frame, uh, I want to refer to the street activism uh, as a strategy from 1992 and a strategy that allows, uh, allows people who are generally powerless uh, against the state to gain some power and some um, some prominence in the, the, the in the conversation with the government, and finally, I want to uh, uh, talk uh, briefly about what happened after the protests and where we are uh, when it comes when it comes to feminists uh, mobilizing right now, and particularly pay attention to everyday feminism for ordinary people, uh, particularly in the context of struggles for care feminism and feminism for ninety nine percent, which is something that ties into the. Uh, my previous talk, uh, the need to appreciate and emphasize the care and social reproduction, but also to set this uh, protest in a broader context of crises of social reproduction exhibited uh, within those four crises that uh, we experienced in Poland over the last few years, COVID-19, abortion or ref uh, reproductive rights crisis, refugee crisis at the Belarusian border and war in Ukraine. And the two sets of data that I'm uh, uh, referring to in this talk, one is the book that I wrote, uh, which is called Broken Genealogy, uh, Political and Social Activism of Women Post-1945 and the Contemporary Women's Movement in Poland, and the report uh, activist work that I did with a feminist organization, which is called There is Oppression, There is Resistance. Uh, which was the uh, the goal of this uh, of this uh, report was to see where the feminist movement is after 2020 uh, protests, but the longer perspective um, allows us to see the current struggle as building on the decades of women activism in Poland, as a and as a part of the longer struggle on behalf of women's uh, of gender equality. And there are several momentous events or critical dates for the struggle. First is, first is in 1918 and pre-war emancipation. And women in Poland got the election rights in 1918 as a result of their, uh, or as a thank you uh, for their engagement in the, uh, for the fighting for Poland's independence. Uh, then we have post 1945 state center women's emancipation. Uh, then we have a prominent presence of women in solidarity movement, uh, mostly uh, omitted in the mainstream history and consciousness rising and service activism of the late 1980s. In 1990s, abortion becomes a major democratization debate in Poland. In 2000, after the thousands, early 2000s, after the EU um, uh, membership, mainstreaming of the gender equal, man, mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming becomes a main policy on, on behalf of gender equality, and feminism becomes uh, kind of uh, co-opted by the state institutions. And then in 2000, we have, uh, in 2000, first two decades of 2000, we have a revival of the street activism, which we see the tip of the wave of the street activism in 2020 demonstrations against the restrictions on the abortion law. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, wave of emancipation that I want to tackle in this talk is the post-1945 state socialist emancipation, something that is often omitted when we talk about the emancipation of women uh, or gender equality in Eastern Europe and in Poland. Uh, this uh, state socialist emancipation consisted mostly on mass incorporation of women into a labor force and state provisions uh, regarding social reproduction, uh, particularly introduction of the social uh, public childcare, uh, and debate of or uh, about gender division of labor within the marriage. 
uh, one can argue that what happened after Poland, particularly in the immediate post-war post -war period in 19, after 1945, was the um, reconstruction of the social contract. Not only women were economically, 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 economically uh, independent, but also they became socially independent thanks, thanks to the several laws that were introduced in 1945 civil marriage decree and in 1946 family law, which allowed for the recognition of women as civil subjects and made uh, divorces uh, uh, much easier than they used to be. So women were free not only economically, but civically as well. Uh, this, social, this reconstruction of the social process was accompanied by the process of institutionalization of the women's movement in 1946. Women's department modeled after Jeanne Hotel uh, in post-revolutionary post uh, Russia was uh, founded. And in 1952, women's equality was put into the constitution. In 1956, uh, abortion, abortion was legalized in Poland, but not as a way of uh, granting women a right to choose and recognizing women's bodily autonomy, but rather as a way to eliminate illegal procedure, procedures as, as a tool of democratic, demographic policy. Uh, women, uh, women's rights were seen as a uh, women's rights and health were seen as a part of the social issue of the family planning, but that that, that does not mean, and I want to emphasize that that uh, women's rights were not part of this uh, of this agenda. Uh, and we, if we, when we talk about state socialist emancipation in case of Poland, we can all, only talk about the very brief period of time between 1946 and 1949, when this had the radical shape of political uh, aim to, to introduce a radical political change. Uh, after 1956, during post-Stalin, post -Stalin, uh, during the period of the thaw, uh, there was a change of the course when the gender equality was concerned, the return to patriarchy, depolitization, and the movement towards the practical activism, which aimed mostly at allowing women to combine the roles uh, as a, in the workforce with the traditional roles as caregivers and mothers. I think an important uh, moment, this event or movement was the solidarity movement. And you probably recognize Lech Wałęsa as the leader of this movement, uh, of this mo movement and the strike in 1980s. But not many people know that women such as Joanna Gwiazda, Alina Pienkowska, Anna Valentinovich, and Henryka Krzywonos were organizing, organizers of the 1980s strikes. And they were the ones who did not allow the strike to end when all the men wanted to go home and stop the strike. In the 1981, after the uh, solidarity was briefly legalized, women, uh, 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 the union consisted in 50% of women. Uh, and uh, uh, during the during the time of the martial law, Helena, women practically uh, led the movement uh, uh, in the face of the fact that most of the men leader were leaders were in jail, particularly women such as Helena Uchevo, who was editor of the Underground Press. Uh, even uh, 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 regardless of the fact that women were very important in the solidarity movement during the roundtable negotiations in 1989. Only 55 out of 700 participants were women, and only one woman, Grażyna Staniszewska, was a participant of the plenary session. And this uh, this was uh, later on uh, examined and uh, recognized as a big solidarity secret by American scholar Shana Penn in her book, Solidarity Secret. Uh, Transformation proved to be an ambivalent process when it came to gender equality. On the other hand, there were on one hand, there, there were positives, free elections, a full package of citizens' freedoms. Uh, women could uh, engage in civil society organization and political parties, for instance, and there was a possibility to uh, fund, fund uh, feminist organizations. But on the other hand, there were also negatives. Uh, society became more prone uh, to conservatism and nationalism as well as traditional traditionalism. Many socialist provisions for women were removed. Transformation, free, uh, transformation to free market proved to be burdensome for some women, especially uh, in case of unemployment and the double shift that women had to manage. Uh, women 
uh, women's rights were deemed marginal and pushed aside as a cultural rather than political issue and contentious issues related to the fight for reproductive uh, freedom rec were recognized by as divisive and political parties were unwilling to take them up and on the left hand side on the right hand side uh, you have the little uh, graph that shows the uh, in particular the a uh, very um, significant drop in the political participation of women uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. This is the moment where the quota, so socialist quotas were no longer in place and the free, uh, free elections took place and the participation of uh, women dramatically dropped. And then it's it, uh, systematically raised uh, over the next decade, de decades. Uh, this transformation was uh, the transformation, economic and political transformations were also accompanied by the discursive transformation and cultural transformations. And there were several narratives uh, that uh, that we can identify when we talk about the feminist feminism after 1989. And this is this narratives or these discourses are not only characteristic to Poland, but I think also for to Eastern Europe in general. First, there was a narrative of luck. Eastern Europe was seen and represented as a space of luck of feminism of liberalism, and in that sense, communism was not seen as exemplification of any kind of feminism. Second, there was the delay uh, narrative that represented Eastern Europe as behind the West and as, uh, as, as in the quest to catch up with the West. So the West became a, a point of reference for Eastern European feminisms, and everything was measured against the, what, what is happening in Western Europe and the United States, and the, everything that was happening all of the legacies, for instance, the legacies uh, from the region, such as state socialist uh, emancipations were not taken into account and disregarded under the kind of bigger frame of anti-communism, anti uh, which uh, argued that communism brought, brought nothing new to the society's development, that it was a regress, not a progress, and also in terms of uh, the equality. And uh, overreaching the, those narratives about feminism, there were also uh, mainstream narratives uh, about feminism that perceived feminism as in generally foreign to Poland, on one hand as a Soviet imposition, on the other hand as a Western import. Uh, but uh, we also have to see this in the context of the of the um, big divisions of polarization of the society within the period of the transformation. And Michał Buchowski, Polish anthropologist, uh, described this phenomenon as a nesting uh, orientalism. It's the process uh, of the internal division of the society between us, civilized, individualistic, realistic, capable of assimilation to the Western standards, so those who catch up with the West, and them egalitarian, demanding, anti-intellectual, unable to adjust to new Western reality, the so-called so homo sovieticus. And this divide was uh, done uh, along the line of the division between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, but it was also an internal division within the Eastern European society. So on one hand, you had this westernized version of society, and on the other hand, you have those who were lagging behind. And this is important to uh, remember, especially when we talk right now about the um, right-wing populism and the return of the conservatism, because one can argue that this is the result of this division that was uh, unaddressed during the last 20 years. But in Poland, legal abortion became the uh, major contentious re issue when it came to women's rights, uh, because it was not only about women's rights, but it was predominantly about the role of the Catholic Church and the new democracy, and the question of what, are, what will be the values of this new democracy. Um, in general, abortion was framed as a part of the unwanted communist uh, legacy, but also but also it was um but but also it was it can be seen as the uh, as, a, as a moment in which the, uh, the type of the democra democracy in Poland was decided on one hand we had a participatory democracy uh embo embo embodied especially in the proposal for the abortion referendum that was dismissed by the parliament uh, in the 93 and participatory democracy was dismissed uh, versus formal democracy the compromise between political elites and the catholic uh, church uh, the 1995 uh, on, this is the period of institutionalization and Europeization of the feminist movement, uh, particularly after the Beijing conference, UN Beijing conference of women, in which, after which the NGOs became the major actor in the, in the scene, fighting for women's equality. This is also the time uh, of uh, Europeization and the time in which gender mainstreaming uh, is recognized as a major uh, policy state uh, transnational and state policy when it comes to uh, equality rights 
Following that, we have the period of one can argue a co-optation of the movement by the state, several figures from the state and from the, from the NGO movement, civil society moved to the state positions, including Anna Grotzka, the first trans transgender member of parliament, and Robert Biedroni, founder of uh, one of the LGBTQ NGO, then member of parliament and the president of the city, now member of European parliament. Uh, this uh, the re uh, reaction to cooptation was the revival of street activism, uh, particularly uh, in the early 2000s, and we have the uh, uh, returning to celebrations of the uh, 8 March uh, International Women's Day, the communist um, the communist celebration that was dismissed and then uh, kind of regained by the younger generations of activists uh, starting 2001, and also uh, equality marches the um, or uh, gay pride parades start in Poland in, after 2000s. Uh, this is all happening uh, during the time uh, of the backlash, and we basically can backlash against gender equality in Poland, broadly speaking. Uh, this backlash, I, I would say, has two phases. Uh, first phase is the attacks on the abstract gender in the context of Istanbul Convention uh, since 2012, and it's a part of the transnational de-democratization processes. We see the similar processes in Russia, Hungary, and Sweden. And the second phase is targeting specific social groups, attack, uh, and this uh, include attacks on equality marches, uh, physical attacks, verbal attacks by Catholic church representatives, uh, verbal attacks by politicians, including, unfortunately, Polish president, and also the establishment of the so-called LGBT LGBT free zones. As of late June 2020, approximately 100 Polish municipalities had adopted resolutions declaring themselves LGBT free zones. You might have heard about it. Most of them denounced those re resolutions in the face of the uh, danger of losing EU grants uh, after having appointed them. And the feminist wave, one can argue, started to rise already in 2016 uh, when we, we went, when we uh, had black protests and women's strikes on October 20, uh, 2016. Uh, These were the protests organized against the ban, the plan to restrict abortion uh, law. Importantly, there is a very uh, it, it, there is a qualitative difference uh, or shift uh, in activism in 2016. Uh, on one hand, we have uh, the first uh, appearance of the connective activism on connectivism, or connective action, uh, which uh, has no clear readership, not collective identity, and it's also in many instances instances based uh, on social media. On the other hand, we have the example of this power of powerless, uh, which means that agency goes to the people who have the least to say in a society in which a society is uh, the, uh, the the government does not listen to the uh, society anymore, and women and uh, LGBTQ communities are seen as such. Uh, there are several components of the rising wave, the wave that we experienced in, two, in 2020, uh, to, uh, 2017 Me Too movement, the revival of socialist or social feminism, and uh, introduction of solidarity-based intersectional feminism, the feminism that combined the struggle for women's rights, LGBTQ uh, rights, women with disabilities, migrant women, um, we also see the evolution of pro-abortion activism. Unfortunately, I have no time to tell you more about this. Uh, so going back, and I'm finishing uh, one more minute, uh, going back 2020 and 2021 protest, this can be called the tip of the feminist wave uh, as an illustration of the weak resistance pract uh, practiced by ordinary feminine and queer subjects on everyday basis, embracing empathy, solidarity, endurance, and failures. This could be also seen in a pop as a populist moment or left wing populist moment as a potential political strategy, political uh, not ideology used in context of post democracy. And this could also be seen as a recounting of the social division. So putting uh, putting up the new political frontier, recounting of who is us as who is them when you when uh, when you think about this division between us and them the elites and the and the post-socialists so homo sovieticus this i think was the moment in which the political scene was redrawn uh, in the sense that the minorities people who were seen as a minorities up until 2020 realized that we are actually a majority and this is my um, almost last slide 
Uh, I want to briefly tell you about what happened about uh, after the, the wave of the protest, because many people said that, you know, the, the, this energy from the protest died out and government waited it out. Uh, but uh, the research that we conducted with the Feminist Foundation uh, provides us with the information of what is the legacy of this of this protest. And uh, I'm just going to note these uh, points. First of all, uh, we found out that there is a significant shift in of the kind of activism this from uh, pro, from reactive activism that was uh, aiming at reacting to the uh, rest restrictions from the government to proactive activism that is based into the in the community's needs and is uh, is uh, drawing from those communities rather than look looks into the what is happening in the government side. It is focused uh, focused on work related to social reproduction. Uh, is it, it is present in various communities outside the center. It is very important that we see the uh, going the feminism going down and activism is not no longer the idea that is going uh, from top to the bottom in a pedagogical manner, but it is the practice that is being shared horizontally between various uh, uh, communities uh, locally. They also represent new feminist values, radical empathy, responsibility, solidarity, next to equality and freedom. And important to note is also that this is also feminism that is burnt out. So we have feminists who are doing a lot, uh, a lot on different fronts. Uh, including reproductive rights, managing the COVID crisis, managing the Belarusian uh, um, border crisis. Uh, so there is a revolutionary ferment, but on the other hand, there is a huge um, need to um, self-care and uh, kind of reacting to the uh, to the burnout. Uh, so this is. Uh, to, this is to sum up uh, the, the feminist and queer groups take an active stand against the oppression so they are proactive not reactive anymore uh, their activism is both rooted in the previous historical strategies so they tap into those legacies that I talked about including the socialist state socialist uh, emancipation but they also uh, bring in change connective activism social media and intersectionality uh, there is the uh, there is the revol it is a revolution revolutionary moment, uh, but there is also uh, a need to uh, mm, to take care of the well being of the activist and especially feeling of being very in a very vulnerable position against the state that is uh, on not only using those this this uh, this energy but it's also acting against this energy. Um, yeah, so maybe I will stop here yeah thank you very, thank much, you very much for your another very profoundly uh insightful presentation thank you very much then the uh we invite dr t for the comment for the first part of the uh yes. presentation so 10 minutes please 10 minutes okay that's um should be enough i have taken so many notes um as you can see i hope i can uh finish in 10 minutes but um first of all thank you so much um for uh the presentation um i don't want to uh make any mistakes but dr Gra grawoska is that is that okay with this pronunciation i apologize um if it's the wrong pronunciation but thank you so much for your really insightful and um very interesting um, uh, presentation. I am very sorry that I'm not there in person. Um, if I were there, I would like to have invited you out for a beer after this and just talked about um, various things I wanted to, what I would say today, uh, and just, you know, spend all night talking about um, various very, you know, similarities that we have in Japan and, and Korea, which is the area that I work on. And, um, uh, but I will be back in Sapporo in uh, seven days. So hopefully we'll be able to have a chance to, to go out and, and share a beer. Um, so uh, I wanted to, there's a couple of things that I wanted to um, mention as a as the discussant today. It's actually kind of interesting that I just finished writing a paper on um, mothers that uh, took action after the 311 nuclear, after the um, uh, the Great Eastern uh, earthquake in uh, 
in uh, Japan, um, it, the the mothers. I, I just finished writing a, a paper about the mothers that had uh, the grassroots grassroots activities about um, the anti nuclear and um, anti radiation sort of movement um, that took place in the Tohoku area after the Fukushima uh, disaster. And so it comes at a really sort of for me as a sort of um, a great time to think about uh, things about you know gender equality and feminism and and women's sort of um, uh, input on social uh, in, on, in society. The first thing that I wanted to ask about um, is about religion. Now, of, of course, we have you know similar problems in East Asia, but religion um, oftentimes is not a big variable in East Asia. Having said that, um, Christianity in East, in Korea uh, can be considered as a variable, but I think um, in terms of uh, religion, I think one of the, the differences we have perhaps in Eastern Europe or in Europe and in Asia in general is the impact of religion. So I was wondering um, if I can ask about the sort of religious effect on um, the, the refugee issue and also the LGBT issue. For instance, in Japan, um, religion is not so much a problem, but uh, we still have you know, various problems concerning the LGBT uh, community in Japan. It's more about the political situation. So we have a very conservative party that's ruled for more than 60 years. And uh, they're the ones that are, you know, sort of very much against uh, legalizing same-sex marriage. Uh, whereas I think perhaps in Poland or in Eastern Europe, maybe perhaps that's maybe to, due to religion. So I wanted to ask about that. That's my first question. Second is about, um, um, it's a, a sort of a specific comment about the Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Um, I will also work on migration as well. And I always talk about sort of, you know, um, mobile, even in the 21st century, you have mobile bodies and immobile bodies. Yeah. Um, for instance, the Ukrainian refugees, women are women and children are mobile whereas men are not, yeah? And um, that's obviously the case for Japan as well. So we're accepting Ukrainian evacuees in Japan. And um, the sort of uh, idea is that, um, that Japan is using that as, as a leverage, perhaps. I, I don't want to, I, I don't have enough time to elaborate, but um, the Ukrainian women are mobile and thus they come to Japan as evacuees. Um, Japanese state, in fact, is accepting them for various reasons, but they're using the Ukrainian refugees as leverage in terms of trying to revise their own uh, immigration law and refugee law. And um, it's not, I don't want to, I don't want to make this make it sound as if I'm criticizing the Japanese state, which I actually am. But there, we have various evacuees from various parts of the world. We have, um, um, you know, evacuees, refugees from Myanmar. From you know, we have Rohingya that are here. We have um, Kurds that come here as refugees or seeking a refugee status. But uh, once the Ukrainian refugees or evacuees had arrived in Japan, um, there has been a lot of criticism against how we treat the evacuees. Yeah, So the Ukrainian evacuees, for, for instance, have, I don't, again, um, I don't want to step on anybody's on his foot, but like the criticism is that there is much more support for the Ukrainian rather than some of the Asians that come. And again, you know, these people are, uh, barely had escaped to their you know, barely barely had escaped to Japan to to you know escape from danger and violence and whatnot. But there is a difference in the way that Japanese government treats them. So um, I just wanted to ask about. So you, you were saying about the Polish state, how uh, that that they say that they're doing all these various things for the Ukrainian refugees. Yet perhaps maybe you know there are. You know, maybe they're using that as leverage as well. So I was wondering, you know, if you can maybe mention uh, a word or two about that. My third point is about capitalism as well. Um, I am very critical of capitalism. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not a Marxist, but in in many ways, I am also very very critical about capitalism. In Japan, in Korea, in East Asia, 
not only even East Asia, I mean, you just explained to us, you know, the, the work that women do comes, you know, the, much of it is unpaid and it comes as, you know, you know, for granted. And especially after COVID as well in Japan and also in Korea and many of the Eastern East Asian countries, um, it's become much more, um, uh, it, it's, become, it's become much more sort of vivid that we rely so much on women. And um, after COVID, we realized, uh, Japanese society realized, there are so many women that, are, that, that um, have been laid off from work simply because, because of COVID, right? So a care worker has been, you know, they have been laid off because they can't go to work because of COVID. Um, a lot of, because a lot of women are working in irregular, as irregular workers or part-time workers, they've been laid off because they're the first ones that to go, they're, they're the first ones to go. Um, and, you know, obviously also um, we do a lot of outsourcing of care in, in East Asia as well. Um, and, you know, it's about time that we realize, you know, we've been, we've been relying way too much on, you know, sort of, I don't even know what the word is, but, you know, so the, uh, the, the care work that we, that, that women do. And I think COVID, you know, obviously had a lot of, you know, uh, have had negative effects in various, in various aspects, but I think in, in some respect, I think it's been, positive in the sense that all these issues had come up and we are now finally able to face it in Japan. Um, but I also wanted to talk, I will just, you know, a comment about, you know, some unpaid work. And I mean, that's not, it's not only in, in Poland, but it's, it, it's everywhere, right? We're talking about, you know, how women's work go unnoticed, it's unpaid, yet the work we do is so much, yeah? And, um, and also the, the, the very fact that, care work in Japan or in Korea is very much a low paid job. That's why Japanese, you know, affluent young people don't go into care work. That's because it pays low. Yeah. That, so really, in essence, it might be a very simple solution to the to the problem is just raise the pay for care workers. Yet, you know, that doesn't happen. So I just I wanted to kind of mention that as well. Um, my Sorry, I had two more two more points. Um, my uh, second to last point is about um, the relationship between socialism and gender equality. So I have a lot of students that come from China who want to work on gender equality, and I always tell them, "Well, isn't it in socialism and communism that isn't it? So, you know, it it it's it's a given fact that gender equality is 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 a given fact, or you know, one of the underlying principles." And they say, "Well, they say that, you know, but." obviously that's not the case. So, you know, I was wondering, like you said that there is a divide between East and West Europe, but also there is a divide between Europe as an entirety and East Asia. And um, Japan never had experience of capitalism, obviously South Korea did it as well, but um, it's, it's not just about, I think the ideology that, that, that you know, various countries, um, you know, pursue. It, at the end of the day, it, it's about gender, you know, traditional gender roles. And I just kind of wanted to mention that as a comment. Last but not least, um, you were talking about the sort of, um, the uh, sort of dying down of feminist movements, you know, after, you know, sort of meet, you said that in Poland, there was also the, the Me Too movement as well. And it's kind of dying down and people are kind of losing a little bit of faith, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think that was the, that was the last uh, um, couple of things that you said. That's the same thing that's been said about South Korea. A lot of women here, a lot of feminists um, here in, in South Korea are losing faith. But um, having said that, they're now talking about um, establishing a national museum on gender equality. So Korea was one of the first East Asian countries that uh, established a ministry of gender equality. Now with the new conservative party, there's talks about, you know, abolishing the entire ministry. But having said that, there has been, you know, you know, achievements that have made, um, even within the, you know, even within the conservative, conservative uh, leadership that we have here in Korea, there are, they are talking about, you know, establishing this museum, a national museum. We do have pri private uh, museums on, say, comfort women and all, and, um, and whatnot, but uh, a national museum on gender equality is uh, something that's never, you know, been, been, um, 
realized in South Korea, but even with even under this conservative party or concept conservative leadership, we're talking about this here in Korea. So I just wanted to say that perhaps maybe um, you don't have to lose too much. We can hold on to our, our hope and 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 hope that that uh, that things will get a little bit better. I am an optimist, so maybe perhaps that's why I would uh, I say this. But that's the last thing I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Naomi. And thank you very much from Seoul. And uh, uh, sorry for the uh, time is very <laughs> uh, uh, schedule is very tight. So the five minutes to <laughs> could you please reply to the uh, Naomi for five minutes? Mm -hmm. So I'm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting comments and questions. I would like, I think, to focus on two, on the first two, maybe. Uh, first, about the Catholic the Church, the religion. I would say that there is a difference, of course, between religion and church. And I think uh, when you talk about the case of Poland, I think you have to consider that difference, because all the studies show that uh, Polish people are less and less religious. And at the same time, more and more um, pro-equality, pro-abortion, pro-LGBTQ rights. Uh, that And that is one side of that. So the secularization of the society is happening. And this is, uh, as scholars show in Poland, it's a, it's a big process that's unavoidable because this is something that happens everywhere. But I think, that, and this is one side. And the other side is this formal democracy in Poland that is founded on the compromise and the coalition and the elite exchange uh, between Catholic Church uh, and liberal and conservative politicians without the, above the heads of the people, so to speak. Uh, so in that sense, these are two different uh, registers. And uh, uh, while one can be addressed, the, you know, the, 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 the loss of, the, the loss of uh, impact of the religion in the society on the, on the practices, for instance, uh, I think the second one, which is the foundational, you know, the, the moment of democracy in Poland was the coalition between pol the, the politics and the co Catholic Church. And this is very hard to untie it. Uh, moreover, I think that there is an active, proactive uh, um, uh, steps are taken to uh, prevent this for ha from happening. And this is not only uh, right-wing right politicians, but also liberal politicians are not willing to do this untying of the Catholics, Catholic Church from, from Polish politics. So I say, I would say, so So that would be my my response. I, I, I say religion, I think this is happening, but uh, this at the political register, I think it's much more difficult to this for this to happen. And we can see that uh, uh, with the example, for instance, of the abortion, right? Which, you know, the society supports abortion, not only women, but men, everybody, but political elites are not ready for it, even though society is ready because, you know, obviously they have an alliance with Catholic church. Um, and the second uh, thing is the double standard when it comes to uh, people seeking refuge in Poland. And this is why I talked about the uh, um, the humanitarian crisis at the Belarusian border that is happening in Poland since uh, early 2000, 2000, no, early 2000, uh, early 21, really. And this is basically uh, that people uh, are trying to get into European Union from different countries, including Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, illegally, but they are looking for the asylum in Poland, but they are not letting in. Moreover, they are being pushed back into the Belarusian uh, border uh, during winters, which are really severe in that part of Poland. So they are um, basically destined to death. And uh, this is oftentimes in, uh, in the society debate compared to the way in which the Polish society and Polish government welcomed uh, you know, much bigger group of Ukrainian um, refugees, because this is uncomparable, really. So, of course, there is many different explanations to that. One is the, that the government just uh, did the, and this is very cynical explanation, that the government followed, so to speak, the, um, the, the current attitude of the society. So the society wanted to support Ukrainian refugees while they knew that the society is very resistant to, uh, to support uh, refugees from outside Europe and not our neighboring countries. And the other, of course, explanation is pure racism, uh, that it's uh, Poland is a pretty homogenous society and Ukrainian uh, refugees or migrants are fitting very well 
both in terms of uh, skin color and the language. Uh, uh, unlike the, uh, the 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 migrants from other parts of the world, so I think this would be the the other. But this is obviously uh, definitely uh, uh, also uh, happening uh, in Poland and in the European Union in general, because this is not only uh, about Poland. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that we can uh, lab, uh, you know, uh, continue so, yeah. this discussion when I return to Zapporo. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, then the, uh, we, uh, I would like to invite another uh, commentator, uh, Professor Mie Nakachi. Uh, okay, yes. Um, thank you for the very, very rich overview and analysis of the development of women's activism in Poland, stretching the period from 1918, I think your talk uh, suggested, um, to the present day. You know, it's, it's really a hundred year <laughs> overview uh, in 20 minutes. So of course it was very dense and rich. Um, I'm not a specialist on Poland, but a scholar of reproductive politics and uh, reproductive rights, uh, primar primarily looking at the Soviet Union, as you might know. Uh, so my comments and questions come from comparative perspectives. I remember that uh, when I first saw the news um, of Polish women, you know, protest, uh, against further restriction on abortion back in 2016. Um, and of course, you know, there have been many more since then. Um, I was very surprised by the scale of women's participation uh, and by the fact that women marching on the street were of very diverse ages, uh, both old and young. I wondered how how it is that such an impressive level of women's mobilization for women's for the women's cause uh, could be achieved, uh, particularly since such level of mobilization of women was unthinkable to me uh, to see in Russia. I, I didn't think, and I don't think still. Of course, one of the causes must be that abortion policy affects all women without exception. And the effect could be a matter of life and death. So maybe that helps this kind of you know, level of mobilization. Other than that, I did think about two other elements. One is uh, what you described as Europeanization, you know, some kind of uh, influence and support from the European you know, Union and women uh, of uh, Europe, and the wide use of social media in Poland. Yet I still thought that there must be some historical and cultural roots that is, that is unique uh, to Poland, or at least something that did not happen in the Soviet Union. And indeed, I think in your talk, your genealogy ta taught me that such a historical uh, route. Uh, in the Soviet Union, the socialist progressive policy toward women and intense efforts to organize women into politics began as you mentioned actually in your talk, also immediately after the 1917 revolution. And um, however, uh, it was forced to end in 1930 already. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that. And after that, women's activism and mass mobilization for the women's cause became basically impossible, right? So there was a brief moment um, of underground feminist movement in the 1980s, but it was a small scale and it kind of went abroad as well. Uh, so um, there was practically no mobilization of women on, um, on the mass scale until the end of the Soviet Union. I mean, the possibility you know, came afterwards, although it was never really utilized. So there was a, you know, more than half a century of break. Yes, and I think this is one of the causes of um, unsuccessful mobilization of women in Russia today. Uh, the fact that you know nobody had you know memory of having done it. In contrast, the Polish experience of socialist progressive gender politics began 
uh, in the post-war period. And although there was a break, right, the return of patriarchy you talked about after 1956, but opportunity for activism seemed to have come back fairly, you know, quickly from my point of view. You talked about uh, how during the solidarity movement, yes, there were women leaders um, and organized strikes. And um, so this movement was sustained also by women leaders through, I think you talked about or wrote about uh, underground publication in the 1980s for nearly a decade, right? Until the fall of communists pretty much. So Polish women had the experience of mobilization you know, as recent memory in the way Soviet women didn't. Um, and I think that it, is probably an important you know, background for uh, post-communist women's activism in Poland. Um, so that's my comment. Uh, now I have several questions, um, which, uh, you know, some of which will be on historical issues and but, uh, others uh, more on contemporary issues. Um, so first, you talked about the 1956 uh, legalization of abortion in Poland. And before your talk today, we started chatting already on this issue. Uh, the Soviet Union re-legalized abortion in 1955, and the majority of socialist countries in Eastern Europe followed this, you know, this Soviet policy soon after, and Poland and Bulgaria the first um, to legalize abortion. And it happened, as you said, in 1956. Then Hungary, Romania, and Czechoslovakia followed soon afterward. Uh, the Soviet decision to re-legalize abortion actually was uh, based on the recognition of women's right to abortion, which is something that I wrote in my book. But this fact was hidden in the legal text. So um, one of the things I've been very interested in or you know, curious about is whether or not the idea of this woman's right to abortion was tr transmitted to Eastern European countries in some ways. And your talk and our chat <laughs> makes it very clear that the 1956 legalization of abortion in Poland was not in recognition of women's rights. So my question is, how or when do you think the idea of, women's, um, of uh, abortion as women's right emerged in Poland? In what context? Was it under the, the socialist regime? Uh, or is it afterwards, after the end of communist regime? Um, my second question uh, is about the term feminism. Uh, in the Soviet Union, feminism uh, was a much despised concept, and you may be familiar with that, uh, because it was considered a bourgeois ideology, right? And for a long time, that remained that way. And when I talked to even some you know, feminist uh, Russian women, or sometimes men, they still, you know, sort of carry <laughs> this sense, it seems. So my question is, um, does this term feminism have any historical baggage in Poland? Uh, if so, how do activists get around this problem? And if not, why uh, is it the case? Uh, my third question is, about contemporary uh, situation, something that you know your slide had, but you had no chance to talk about. I think uh, so. My question is about transnational activism. Um, so women's activism often crosses the regional uh, or national borders in various ways. And several years ago, I heard from a Swedish, you know, uh, feminist scholar um, that today. Um, Many Swedish activist women uh, want to support Polish women seeking uh, abortion service because they have the memory of being helped by Polish women in the past. Uh, so um, I'd be very curious to hear about this kind of you know, transnational activism, yes, uh, involving Polish uh, women and other, uh, you know, I mean, you know, other activists from other countries. Finally, <laughs> uh, this is also a very, very contemporary uh, question. How do you see Polish women's activism, particularly in the worldwide reproductive rights movement? Until 2021, it seems that Pol Poland was a little bit of an anomaly among 
the Catholic nations, because I think the trend is uh, liberalization of abortion. In uh, 2018, Ireland legalized abortion. Yes. Uh, in South America, also, you know, this trend is uh, very visible. Argentina liberalized uh, abortion in 2020. Mexico decriminalized abortion in 2021. So against this back background, Poland seems to be going a little bit backward, perhaps. However, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade uh, that took place this you know, year uh, in the United States, I'm wondering if Poland is actually leading an emerging trend of increasing restriction on, uh, on abortion in countries where the procedure has been available for quite some time. I mean, this is not my wish. Is there such a possibility? So is Poland behind or ahead of the trend? Thank you. Thank you very much. Then the, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Gravowska to reply to her mm -hmm. for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Very inspiring comments and questions. Uh, and I have five minutes to respond. Uh, so maybe I will start from the last one. Um, I hope it's not the part of the trend. And I would say um, that it's probably both. Uh, that it is behind, um, in a sense, um, in, a, in a way in which the political process is going, and it is ahead in the sense of where activism is going. Um, and this um, maybe will tie to the, to the second last question, which is a transnational activism. And in Poland, when we talk about um, the possible possible scenarios for the future, uh, people are most, mostly looking into Argentina, um, into what happened in Argentina in a sense of uh, um, going beyond, you know, what is what is possible, for instance, what, what happened in, in Ireland, right? Um, but I think this, uh, your question uh, ties the, the question of reproductive rights with the bigger question about de-democratization and kind of um, uh, the right wing politics, because I, I don't think we can um, spec, speculate right now which way it will go. I just, you know, from my point of view, uh, I, as, as, I, as, I, as I tried to note in the, in the talk, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of close to the idea of the possibility of the left-wing populism and, uh, and the possibility that, the, uh, that we will be able to overcome uh, the right-wing populism with the tools of populism without kind of reverting to the business as usual, which was the compromise based elite politics. Therefore, you know, my focus is on uh, social movements, because uh, I see that this intersectional social movements are the response to this, to the uh, to to the to this right wing uh, backlash, and in that sense, I would have to say the Polish Poland is forward than backward. In terms of transnational feminism, yes, there is, and this was something that I had to leave out of this talk. But uh, there is a lot, and this is exactly based on what you said, a lot of uh, women from Western Europe and Northern Europe are having this memory of going to Eastern Europe for abortions during state socialism, uh, and there is a lot of. Um, organizations and collectives that are being funded and they have funny names like uh, um, uh, Aunt Basia and Aunt Tresha names after the, um, the, the states in which so there, there's collectives that uh, that are being funded in this in the neighboring states that invite uh, women to have abortions in their countries. Uh, but this is also a very interesting trend in a sense that this is uh, this ties into the new form of organize, organizing. Uh, in, in previous years, the underground abortions were more popular in Poland, so you know clandestine abortions. And right now, this is more about the self uh, self managed abortions and uh, informal self help collectives. So these groups are uh, working kind of as uh, informal collectives rather than organized uh, networks so to speak, I would say, based on kind of a solidarity and exchange rather than uh, solid um, frames. In terms of feminism, I, this is something that, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about, and I mentioned that in one slide, that 
uh, feminism, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the legacy would be dissimilar in Poland that it was in Soviet Union, I would say. And I think my research on um, communist women shows that uh, for communist women, the feminism was not a word because they thought that this is irrelevant for the emancipation project that focuses on working class women. And this was a middle class women's movement unrelated. Uh, and I think in the 1990s, feminism became a bad word uh, from both sides. On one hand, it was uh, associated with the communism, even uh, not rightly so. But on the other hand, it was seen as an import from the West. And this is how it stayed uh, in the, uh, uh, until now. And it's used in the mm, backlash against gender ideology. And the way I think to work with it that, uh, that uh, activists are talking about is to uh, not to defend uh, the term itself, but to sh go back to local legacies that can be seen as feminists, even if they were not called feminists. So in other words, uh, we would say, okay, maybe communist emancipation was not feminist, but it was done for feminist objectives and it did feminist, uh, achieved feminist goals. So we can count it in as a, a part of the feminist legacy or feminist genealogy. Same with the solidarity women, that uh, even though they were not, they would rather die than be called feminists. They, uh, we count them in as a part of the feminist legacy. So th this is the way to kind of avoid this uh, label of being the foreign import, uh, feminism being a foreign import, but also it's a, it's a way of uh, um, escaping that idea that uh, we are behind the West, for instance, because one of the biggest misconceptions about Eastern Europe and all non-Western non non locations is that we are all behind the West when it comes to, East, to the women's rights. And this is not necessarily always the case. Uh, and in terms of abortion and women's rights, uh, I would say that uh, um, from my research, uh, it, it is similar. Uh, it is similar that uh, you you uh, that you mentioned about Russia, in a sense that uh, um, that women's rights were part of the uh, narrative, uh, both in the proceedings of the parliament and in the way in which it was reported by the um, by the women's press, which I looked into. But the women's rights were seen differently. So women's rights were not seen, obviously, as individual women's rights, but rather as a part of the collective rights, collective group emancipation, and kind of a part of the working towards the greatest society in social term rather than in terms rather than individual terms. And there, therefore, I think uh, we in Poland uh, in the 1990s were unable to recognize this 1956 as an advancement of the in the terms of feminism because. And this is where the feminism and choice appears for the first time. The import from the West was that abortion can be argued for only based upon bodily autonomy and uh, individual free freedom for women and the liberal tradition. And because in Poland there was no liberal tradition, there was no collect there was collectivism rather than individualism. Therefore, you know there was no uh, women's rights in abortion even though they were physically there, because you can even, I have highlighted it, rights, rights in the in the writing. So I think it's a matter of uh, interpretations. And I can't remember the first question was. The first question is just answered. Ah, yeah, but I just wanted to say one word about the, because about why it was possible, your comment about why it was possible. Uh, and I think there is, uh, from the perspective of this shorter uh, historical perspective, two two things are important also, apart from the things that you talked about. One is the specific political situation after 2015 in Poland, uh, which was that the government completely closed off channels of communication with the civil society. And, civil, and, and this is part of the explanation. The second part is that the civil society grew after 1989. So there is actually big, big uh, it was not on the streets, it was in the form of civil society organizations and the lobbying and so on, but it was there. And the moment it, it was cut off from the government, it was with kind of the dialogue with the government, the moment it was cut off, it was forced to go on the streets. 
So therefore, uh, street protests became normalized in Poland, also from the perspective of the, not only from this marginalized movement, but also from the opposition movements, opposition parties, for instance, which made, made it possible for different kinds of women, as you said, to go on the streets. Because previously it was, you know, some groups of women, feminist activists, queer activists that were on the streets always. But uh, since 2015, it was uh, legitimate for everybody to go on the streets who was not everybody who was not agreeing with the government. So my friends who were never going on demonstrations started to go on demonstrations, and and this and and once they counted themselves and saw each other, they, they that memory was there. And so 2020 was easier than 2016 because people already had a practice of going uh, going on streets. I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for making you rush, <laughs> making uh, making you to rush. Uh, so the uh, and uh, sorry for the uh, technical problems, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, probably five minutes more. But uh, it's reasonable time to uh, conclude. I think so. Thank you very much again. Uh, the um, Professor Grabowska for your uh, great presentations and uh, uh, Chi san and uh, Nakatsu san, thank you very much. You. And, uh, uh, as you noticed, uh, all of us are women, so the, we, we should start a special collaboration between us. And, uh, and uh, this uh, seminar is the kind of uh, first attempt uh, for the future discussion. So, uh, so, and also thank you very much uh, for all the audience to come to listen to this uh, discussion. Thank you very much.